seated. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Miriam. These great songs about our salvation, and that's what we're going to be looking at in the Word this morning. We're going to go backwards a little bit. Thanks, first of all, to Mark, Pastor Mark, for bringing the Word the last two Sundays. Uh, so appreciative of his uh, ministry in that way. I, I want to go back and finish the Sermon on the Mount, and so we're going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27 here. Matthew 7, 24 to 27. Brothers and sisters, the, the single most important day of your life it is not the day you were born, not the day you were married, it's, it's not the day you got that dream job or that promotion at work. The single most important day of your life is still in the future. It is the day you stand before your maker, the king of kings, and hear him tell you where you will spend eternity. The, the most important day of your life and anyone's life is the day of judgment. When the judge of all the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, will either say to you, come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Or he will say to you, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Brothers and sisters, on that day, nothing about your present existence on this earth will be of any concern to you whatsoever. Your vocation in which you invest 40, 50, 60 hours of your time and energy will be of no consequence whatsoever. Your home, your vehicles, your toys, your hobbies, bank accounts, those temporal things on which right now you spend much of your time and place much of your value will be of no use to you at all. Your, fear, your, your appearance, talents, proficiencies, IQ, athletic abilities, physical health and strength, none of these things will matter in the least. On that day, there will be only one thing about your life on this earth that will be of any concern to you. And that is, did you meet the requirements that the Lord established in order to gain entrance into his kingdom? Are you in or are you out? Will you spend eternity with Jesus in heaven? Will you spend eternity apart from Jesus, with the devil and his demons in hell? And that raises another question. Is it possible to have assurance today that Jesus will welcome you into his kingdom on the day of judgment? C can you know for sure that you really, truly belong to Jesus, and will live with him forever. Especially because, if you remember the last time I preached, Jesus said there's going to be some surprises on that day. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. 
away from me, you evil doer. You need to know that it's not enough to profess to be a follower of Christ. It's not enough to do things, even great things, in Jesus' name. There's something more basic, more foundational about our relationship to Christ that proves we belong to him. We've come to the conclusion of Jesus' sermon on the mount in the last part of Matthew 7. But before we read it, I, I want to remind you that when Jesus taught, whenever he taught, it was not merely to offer a few interesting ideas. It, it was not to stimulate intellects. He did not teach in order to take sides on the theological issues of the day. He taught in order to impart truth that would transform a person's life. He taught in order to rescue people from judgment and hell. And when he taught, the people who were listening were always confronted with a choice. And often it was a choice that would determine their eternal destinies. And that is what he is doing in Matthew 7, beginning in verse 1. 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus closes his famous story with a sermon or excuse me, with the, his famous sermon with a story. Now you may already know that Jesus often told stories about ordinary life in order to illustrate something in the spiritual realm. In this story, he is describing what is going to happen to people on the day of judgment. And he says that, what will happen to people on the day of judgment is determined by what they do with his words. It's extremely important to note that in this story, it's not just about hearing Jesus' words. It's not enough to hear or know or even like what Jesus says. What really matters is what you do with those words. Look what he says in verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Look at verse 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice. Now notice, he does not say what those who do not put them into practice do with those words. Maybe they reject them. Maybe they ignore them. Maybe they say, I'll think about those words later. But however they respond, they all have this one thing in common. They do not apply his words. They do not do what Jesus said. The story goes on to illustrate what happens to each type of person. And Jesus does this by describing every person as a house builder. Look at verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built 
his house on the rock. Verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. Again, every person is involved in the exact same activity. Every single person is a house builder. Everyone is constructing a shelter. That is a point of comparison. In the story. But interestingly, Jesus does not say what kind of a house each person builds. Because the kind of house it is and the way it looks is not important in the story. Now, it's important to us because we live in those houses. And so, We take pains to build a house that suits our particular tastes. One that is comfortable. One that is built with certain kinds of materials. One that is big big enough to accommodate all of our stuff. And, And we tend to be preoccupied with the house. But for Jesus, the house is not the most important thing. In fact, it may be possible to conclude from this parable that Although these two, that that these two houses actually look identical, even though they are fundamentally different. By the way, that's one of the recurring themes in the Sermon on the Mount. Things are not always what they appear. Looks can be deceiving. We saw it in the religious leaders that Jesus exposed when he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. We saw it in the religious activities that people did that were nothing more than performances that called attention to themselves. And we saw it especially in verses 21 to 23 of chapter 7 when Jesus said that there would be many on that day, the day of judgment, who would say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not do wonderful, powerful things in your name? And Jesus would say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. And so it is not surprising that What is most important about this parable is not what you see, but what you cannot see, the foundation. Before we look at that, however, let's look at the other point of similarity in the story, which is the storm. Verse 25, the rain came down. The streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And notice verse 27 starts out exactly the same way. Same words. Now there are two things about this storm that are significant. First, Jesus describes a very intense storm. It includes heavy rains, Flooded streams, gale-forced winds. Secondly, the storm is identical in each story. Each house is ravaged by the same storm with the same intensity. But I want you to be aware that this is not a story about how to escape the storms of life. It is not a parable about how to find a safe climate in which to avoid the storm. No. Each person will face the storm. Every person's house will come under the influence of that storm. And the storm which is, is, the, is the very thing that will reveal that these houses, even though they appear to be identical, are in fact 
very different because they are built on very different foundations. And that is where we come to the one thing that makes these stories different. Jesus is saying that the most important thing about your life is what you have built your house upon. Is it the rock? Or is it the sand? What is your foundation? That's the issue. Because the security and permanence of what you have built is entirely dependent upon your foundation. And when the storm comes, and it most certainly will come, that foundation will determine whether you stand or fall. Look at the end of verse 25. If you have built your house on the rock, your house will stand because it was built on the rock. Now look at verse, the end of verse 27. If you have built your house on the sand, your house will fall with a great crash. Now, let's relate the story back to what Jesus said at the beginning. Every person is a house builder. Every person has built on either one of these two foundations. So what is the foundation? Again, Jesus is talking about people who hear his words and he is saying that those who hear his words and put them into practice, who apply them, are the ones who have a solid foundation and thus will be safe in the storm. Those who hear his words but do not put them into practice, do not apply them, are the ones who will not be safe in the storm. And notice, I think this is important. Jesus is deliberately emphatic about what happens to those people. Look at the end of verse 27. The house fell with a great crash. Again, I want to be clear about this. The storm here is not referring to the difficult circumstances and trials and hardships that we all experience in this life. He's not talking about how we cope with these things. Here's how I know that. Prior to telling this story, Jesus has been talking about a person's eternal destiny. He talked about the narrow gate the difficult road that leads to life, which is a metaphor for heaven. He talked about the wide gate, the easy road that leads to destruction. That's a metaphor for hell. He said that many will be surprised on the day of judgment to learn they never belong to Jesus, even though somehow they were associated with Jesus while living on this earth. He's been talking about life and death judgment, heaven, and hell. He's been talking about what is going to happen to individuals when they come to the end of this life and stand before God to give an account of what they did and the choices that they made. And this is what the storm refers to. God's judgment. Now, here's why Jesus gives us this instruction. Remember what he said in John 3. Uh, it, we, we always quote John, John 3.16, but John 3.17 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Our Lord wants to be absolutely certain. He wants us to be absolutely certain that we are going to be safe 
when the storm comes. Specifically, that we will be safe on the day of judgment. And there's only one way that you can know if you are safe. And I want to be very clear about this. It is not listening to Jesus' words that count. It is not even being able to correctly interpret his words that counts. You can read your Bible 12 hours a day. You can memorize all of Jesus' words. You can be an expert New Testament scholar and still have a foundation of sand because knowledge by itself counts for nothing. Did you hear me? Furthermore, it's not merely agreeing with or liking what Jesus says that counts either. You can nod your head, clap your hands, say amen, be amazed at Jesus' words, and still have a foundation of sand. Jesus says, The way to determine your foundation is by how you respond to Jesus' words. He's talking specifically about whether or not you apply them. Putting into practice. If you were on an airplane, and that airplane was going down, someone offered you a parachute, it's not enough to look at that parachute and know that it could save you. It's not enough to hold it and admire the design or the engineering or the craftsmanship that went into that parachute. It's not even enough to know how it works when you pull the ripcord. The only way that parachute is going to save you is by putting it on and then following the instructions when you jump out of the plane. So what does it mean to put Jesus' words into practice? First, let me tell you what it does not mean. Applying Jesus' words does not mean following a list of do's and don'ts. It, It does not mean trying really, really hard to be good. Or generating enough willpower or discipline to do good work. The Bible makes it clear that our attempts to impress God through our own righteousness is futile. Because anything that we generate in our own strengths is tainted with sin. You might be thinking, but but Jesus said you must put my words into practice. Doesn't that mean we obey what he says? And the answer is, Yes, it does. You say, well, I thought so. And that's what's so disturbing because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that looking lustfully at a woman is adultery. Losing your temper and cursing at someone is murder. He said that we must love people that hate us and hurt us. We must bless those who take advantage of us and pray for those who attack us. He forbid us to worry or to store up treasures on this earth or to judge other people. There's not a person alive who can live up to those standards. All of us come up way short. And I would say again, yes, that's right. Nobody can do this. Nobody can obey this in their own strength. And that's one of the things I've shared with you over and over that Jesus wanted to do in this sermon. He wanted to create a crisis in the hearts of his audience and compel them to admit, ah, 
There's no way I can do this. For when we come to the point of saying there's no way, we come to the point when we discover the way. We can obey what Jesus says here, but only after we have been born again. Only after we have confessed that we are incapable of doing anything on our own to impress God. Only after we've trusted Him to cleanse us and make us righteous in Him. Only after we have trusted Him to make us new creatures who have new capabilities, including obeying the Sermon on the Mount. And only after we have received the Holy Spirit who empowers us to do what he says. And that brings us back to the rock. Remember, it's not the house I build that is the emphasis in this story. It's the rock on which I build. When I am preoccupied with that rock, who is Jesus Christ, when my life is built upon Him, when I have placed my full weight on Him, when He Himself is my righteousness, my salvation, my hope, indeed, when He is my life, that's when I'm safe. From the impending storm. By the way, Jesus used the illustration of a storm because that was something that everyone in his audience could identify with. They had seen these violent storms and squalls around the Sea of Galilee. If Jesus were addressing an audience in Northern California where I grew up. He might have used the example of an earthquake. You've heard of the San Andreas Fault. It goes up the heart of California, then out through the Bay Area, right underneath the South Pier of the Golden Gate Bridge, and then up the coast to Alaska. But do you know where the safest place to be in an earthquake in San Francisco is? It's on the Golden Gate Bridge. And I'll tell you why. Two reasons. First, it is flexible. It's built to sway 22 feet. Now, you might have to hold on, but, but you're not going to fall if you... Second, every piece of steel and concrete relates one to another and to two giant cables that come up to two great piers, each of which go down deep into bedrock with two anchors on each side. That bridge will withstand a 9.0 on the Richter scale because that bridge is preoccupied with its foundation. That entire bridge is completely related to the rock, and that's what makes it secure. Friends, if you want to be secure, your life must be connected to, built upon, preoccupied with, and dependent upon Jesus Christ. He is the rock. He's the only secure foundation. All other ground is sinking sand. And if you build your life on anything else, some other religion, someone else's opinion, 
your good works, your own efforts, anything else, you will not stand up in the storm. You will fall with a great crash. Isn't it interesting (laughs) that that's how Jesus ends his sermon? It will fall with a great crash. That's how he ends it. He he did not end it on a positive, upbeat note. He he did not end it in a way that would make the audience go home feeling good about themselves. He ends it with a warning of judgment. I believe there's a simple reason for that. Jesus knew what hell was all about. That is why he talked twice as much about hell as he did heaven. He spoke of it as a place of conscious, unending torment, a place of utter loneliness, despair, exclusion, rejection, a place of outer darkness where the fire never goes out and the worm never dies, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, A place where there is no relief, no let up, no possibility for redemption. Jesus ended this sermon this way because he knew the horrors of hell. What about you? Do you know for sure where you are going when you stand before the Lord? Are you absolutely certain you have built your house upon the rock? Or is it possible that you have been building on sand? The good news is that even if you've spent your whole life building on sand, you can actually change your foundation just like It's remarkable. That's God's gift to you. And it begins by agreeing with God that you've been building on the wrong foundation. Either a foundation of good works or religion or charitable deeds and gifts or human kindness or whatever else is not Jesus. Then it's a matter of confessing. That Jesus is God's provision for your eternal life. That when he died on the cross, he died for your sins and bore those sins in his body and experienced the punishment you deserve because you were incapable of saving yourself. It's a matter of confessing that Jesus is the Son of God who proved it when he rose from the dead three days later conquered death and made it possible for us to have eternal life. Listen, it's a matter of putting all your weight, all of your trust on Jesus. Please, don't wait until it's too late. What you do with Jesus now determines where you spend eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, these are sobering words. These last several sections in the Sermon on the Mount have been oh so sobering. But Father, thank you for the warning. Thank you that you thought enough of us to know that we can be deluded and deceived. Thank you. But Father, I pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds so that we will not be deceived. None of us will be deceived about where we stand with you if in fact we've been building on sand. Oh God, 
bring clarity for every one of us, please. Bring clarity. And Father, may today be the day of salvation for those who have built on sand. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand if you would.